As always, we're grateful to our sponsors for supporting our Sea Secrets. If we didn't have our sponsors, we wouldn't be able to put on such a great program that we have and bring in some of the uh, fantastic speakers that we've brought in this year. So thank you very much. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to say thank you to, to Bank of America, our presenting sponsor. It's their second year supporting us. We're very grateful your, for your continued support. Um, we also want to thank Bill Galway, the Shepherd Broad Foundation, Cheryl Gold, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, Joan McCann Foundation, Melissa and Taylor White Fund, Meredith Ann Dasberg Foundation, the Wang Family, the Welch Family, and Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits. Thank you. As is the tradition, if you've been coming for years now, we have a uh, special presentation tonight. It's our Rosensteel Underwater uh, Photo Contest. And tonight we'll be doing that presentation. I'd like to uh, introduce um, Mike Schmally. He's the Associate Dean of Infrastructure and Professor of Marine Biology and Ecology. And he's very, a very accomplished underwater photographer himself and provided his expertise and time to help us judge the photos. So please come on up and thank you so much for helping us judge these fine photos. Thanks, Jennifer. It's, it's a lot of fun uh, to be involved in this underwater photo uh, contest uh, as a judge and to see the outcome, and especially fun to get to show you guys the winners. So this photo contest has been going since 2005, and we get entries from all over the world. This year we had over 600 entries in these various categories, uh, and they came from, of course, from the U.S., but also as far away as Russia, Germany, Italy, Austria, and other places. Uh, and before we actually get into the photos, I want to say a few things about the competition. First, I want to start by thanking our sponsors, especially Bill uh, uh, Gawley, who has Galway, who has contributed the, the cash prizes for the competition. And he's been a longtime <laughs> supporter of Rasmus, and we're, we're very, very grateful for, for his support. And I also want to thank Blackbeard Cruises, who once again are donating the, the grand prize for best overall, which is uh, a cruise in the Bahamas on their uh, beautiful sailboat. So the, the images were submitted in five categories that are shown here and in each category there were prizes for uh, first, second, and third place with the first place, place prize being $250, the second place $150, and the third place $100, so I won't repeat that each time. And also each first place image was became a, in each category, became a contender for best overall for the whole competition, which we'll see last. Uh, so I had a lot, I had, it was great to have an opportunity to judge this year, along with Bill Gawley and Evan Del Sandro, who's uh, also a faculty member in marine biology and ecology. And it was very challenging, enjoyable, tough to make these decisions. And I wanted to emphasize two things about the judging. One, it was totally blind. Of course, we didn't know who was submitting photos. But we also had no indication if any photographer was submitting multiple photos. So you'll see we had some multiple winners this year, and that was just a total surprise. It just is a testament to the incredible skill of some of these photographers who won more than one prize. And I also want to say that after you've looked at these kinds of competitions for many years, it becomes sometimes challenging to find the unique and different photos, and that's what we were looking for. We were thinking about things that were unusual, that we didn't see every time. Uh, although most of these photos were ones that you'd be happy to have hanging on your living room wall, well, oftentimes we were drawn to things that were a little unusual or we knew were difficult to photograph. So having said that, let's delve into the competition. The first category is uh, students, and the, oh, sorry, these were uh, individuals who are currently UM students uh, at the undergraduate or graduate level. And honorable mention for this category goes to uh, um, Casey Harris for this picture of a green sea turtle taken in Hawaii. And I think you can agree that there's beautiful lighting here. It looks like mostly ambient lighting. Uh, nice composition on this, this turtle. Third place to uh, Daisy Buzzoni for this picture of these beautiful nudibranchs from uh, Australia, a cold water nudibranch. And to get you oriented a little bit to the picture here, may not be able to, to tell just by, uh, oh, sorry, just by uh, uh, looking at it, the head end of this nudibranch here, the tail end of this nudibranch here, and you can see the, the, the beautiful gill filaments 
uh, on these nudibranchs, the very lovely picture. Uh, second place to Romain Chaput, uh, one of our stu graduate students here at Rasmus for this picture of uh, School of Atlantic Spadefish uh, taken in Belize, Looks like, uh, sorry, in uh, 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 Bearcut Bridge, sorry. Uh, that was changed, wasn't it? Okay. I see. I missed, didn't see that in the earlier version. Uh, th right here in the Bearcut Bridge, you can see the, the pilings there uh, on the bridge. And then our favorite in the, f in the student competition by Enzo Newhart was a picture taken in, uh, in the Galapagos. And this is at one of my favorite dive sites in Galapagos, Corona del Diablo, or the Devil's Crown near Floriana. And I think one of the impressive things about this photo is it really captures the incredible density of fish that you have at some of these sites. You can see in the lower left of the photo these yellow tail grunts, and in the upper right uh, are the hundreds and hundreds of uh, Pacific Creole fish that you can see uh, at this site. So very nice composition, beautiful shot for the first place in the student category. So going into the macro category, this is a category for close-up shots. Up close and personal on marine life, fish, or invertebrates, usually taken with a macro lens or some other close-up assembly that allows you to see things at life size in the image or closer than life size. First shot here, honorable mention by uh, David uh, Lopresti, uh, is a picture of a Bangai cardinal fish in a uh, blue spotted sea, anana, or sea urchin, also called a fire urchin. So this fish is probably only, this juvenile is probably only about a half an inch long or less. And uh, the photographer has captured it beautifully in this uh, nest of very venomous spines. I can tell you from personal experience. Uh, not an easy picture to get. And uh, uh, we thought a beautiful composition. Third place in this competition by uh, Andy Deach is a tiger cardinal fish, also called a large tooth cardinal fish. Now, these fish are only about six to eight inches long, and that's a good thing because those teeth look pretty hazardous. But the amazing thing is if you look really close, you'll see in amongst those teeth are little eyes. And those are the eyes on the eggs of this cardinal fish. So these cardinal fish are mouth brooders. After they spawn, the males and females release eggs and sperm, after they spawn, uh, in pairs, the male picks up the eggs in his mouth and incubates them for about a week until they hatch. Requires a lot of discipline. Male doesn't get to eat during that period of time, but it's really amazing to be able to get a picture like this where you can see the eggs in the mouth. You can even see the eyes in the eggs. Second place goes to uh, Andy uh, Spatak, and sorry if I've mispronounced his name. And this is a nudibranch photographed in uh, Tulumben in the north coast of Bali. And this is an amazing creature. Uh, and like many nudibranchs, instead of gills, this has these long serrata sticking out of the body, which are the sort of the, the out pocketings of the gut and allow the animal to, to respire. Uh, and it's just beautifully lit, and we thought the composition was really special. First place in this category, also by Andre. So a double winner here. And this is a picture of a uh, juvenile octopus of a species called the wonderpus. So these animals live on uh, rocky or reef areas in the tropics. They only get about six, eight inches across, so they're a small octopus. But it spends its uh, larval life in the plankton. And this is a type of photography that we call blackwater photography. So to get this picture, the photographer would be typically floating in the middle of nowhere in the ocean, maybe miles from shore and maybe hundreds of feet of water, about 30 to 60 feet down, trying to focus on little things floating by. Extremely, extremely difficult to do. And this is a very rare shot. I've never seen another picture uh, of this animal from the plankton. So it's a, it's a tiny octopus. And that was first place in the macro competition. All right, the wide angle category is one where 
photographers typically use a wide angle lens to capture sort of a landscape view of the marine environment and it gives you a chance to really tell a story of things you see going on there. The first photograph here is honorable mention winner by David Lep David Lopresti and uh, this is his second honorable mention. He also had an honorable mention in the macro category and this is an amazing photograph of a bait ball of European anchovies being surrounded by juvenile bluefin tuna. And these tuna surround these bait balls and they pack the fish even tighter together, which gives the school of uh, predatory fish a chance to, to home in and feed on them. And when you see all this snow floating in the water, that's probably scales from those anchovies as they're being eaten by these tuna. So this is a really rare thing to be able to, uh, to capture this, particularly with this species of of tuna. So third place in the wide angle goes to Debbie Wallace who is from South Florida. These are Atlantic spade fish uh, photographed in uh, Moorhead City, North Carolina and you can see the, the beautiful lighting and, and composition on this uh, school of fish. Second place to a, a black and white image by Yorick Blessing uh, from the Maldives of reef manta rays. And this is probably uh, a breeding aggregation, the way they're, they're circling each other. So very uh, beautifully uh, arranged and uh, lit picture. First place in the wide angle, also to Debbie Wallace. So, this is a sand tiger shark, which is a species found around the world in tropical and temperate oceans. And she's captured it beautifully surrounded by scad that are probably scattering to try and get out of the way of said sand tiger shark. So to get this particular timing of this arrangement and get all the lighting just right is uh, quite a challenging thing. So that was first place and wide angle. Then in the portrait category, which is an image, image defined as images that really capture sort of the essence of a particular marine fish or invertebrate. And for honorable mention, uh, again, George Blessing, so that he is a, a multiple winner here uh, with this beautifully lit, oops, sorry, beautifully lit shot of a, uh, a green sea turtle posing for the camera with uh, the water surface behind it. Third place, again, another winner for Andy Sheptak uh, of a planktonic uh, macropus to Philippi, which is another small octopus that's found throughout the world in the, in the tropics, again, captured in the plankton, and just a, uh, a beautiful uh, arrangement in this in this photograph and the lighting and, and coloring really amazing and another cephalopod in the plankton this sort of demonic looking diamond squid by Marco Steiner uh, was the second place in the in the portrait category and then the first place in the portrait category this picture of an ocean sunfish so the ocean sunfish has got to be one of the weirdest fish in the ocean. They're just uh, very strangely, uh, very strange anatomy, very strange lifestyle, mostly jellyfish. And to capture, they're very rare fish to see in the wild, especially when you're diving or snorkeling. And to capture this one on a perfectly calm day with this reflection in the water surface, we thought was, was uh, very unique. So that was uh, the first place in portrait division. Okay, and best overall, and again this was chosen as the best the judges liked most out of all the categories, and this was a winner of $300 cash prize plus the Blackbeard Dive Cruise in the Bahamas. And as I say, we were looking for things that were a little bit different. So Dave, David Lopresti, Lopesti, Presti, who um, also won two honorable mentions in other categories, won the best overall for this uh, fascinating portrait 
of a juvenile uh, tritone alpestre, which is basically an alpine newt. So this is a kind of, this is a juvenile stage of a salamander that lives in the water. And thanks again to our sponsors. Thank you, Mike, for that great presentation. And uh, that was really, really interesting. And congratulations to the winners of all the prizes tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce our special spotlight tonight. He's a UM alum who has been appointed to a very unique position at the University of Miami. Xavier, Xavier Cortada is a professor of practice at the university. Through his primary appointment in the faculty of the Department of Art and Art History, he serves in the university's Abbas Center for Ecosystem Science and Policy, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Miami Business School, the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, the School of Architecture, the School of Communication, and the School of Law. Throughout his socially engaged art practice, he addresses environmental concerns and often collaborates with scientists in his art making such as with population geneticists to explore our ancestral journeys out of Africa 60,000 years ago, with molecular biologists to th synthesize, synthesize a DNA strand from a sequence of 400 museum visitors randomly generated, and with botanists to develop multi-year participatory eco-art e efforts to reforest mangroves, native trees, and wildflowers across Florida. He has created environmental installations at the North and South Poles, eco-art projects in Taiwan and Holland, and painted community murals addressing, addressing the um, peace in Cyprus and Northern Ireland, child welfare in Bolivia and Panama, AIDS in Switzerland and South Africa, and juvenile justice in Miami and Philadelphia. His work is in the permanent collections of the Perez Art Museum Miami, the NSU Museum of Art in Fort Lauderdale, the Whatcom Museum, and the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum. Please welcome Professor Cortada. Science is my muse. It is so because artists and scientists both stand on the shoulders of all of those who came before us to try to develop new knowledge new ways of seeing, new ways of thinking. Here I was trying to have folks understand that evolution works. I did so by having a double helix strand cut into 400 little pieces, creating 400 original pieces of art, and then having museum visitors exchange my original artwork for a postcard with the print of one of four paintings I created capturing the four nucleotides that created everything that has ever lived lives or will ever live on planet Earth. After we put that sequence randomly on the wall of the museum, we counted the sequence and then cloned it into an E. coli in a Petri dish and discovered, as published in Science Magazine, that 400 museum visitors had randomly created a piece of DNA sequence that is found in chromosome three of your body. Similarly, I wanted to honor one of the great science achievements that has happened. Uh, scientists, a few years ago, were able to finally prove that the standard, standard model of physics works, that it's real. And they did that by discovering what you may have heard about in media called the God particle, or the Higgs boson. They did so by smashing 400, I'm sorry, 40 million protons a second on a super collider uh, that sits on a 17-mile um, circumference machine, the most complex, compact machine that humans have ever built. And in so doing, they were able to generate this particle, this elusive particle called the Higgs boson, and they did so by looking at five search strategies. So I created five pieces depicting their science, depicting literally the visualizations of these collisions, but more importantly, I did so by including the 383 articles that these 4,000 scientists and engineers had published in trying to create that discovery. So not only was I honoring 
the science, but I was literally honoring the scientist. And at the unveiling of these five banners that stand 100 meters above the place where that collider sits, we made the scientists into quarks by putting LEDs on their caps and made the facility a proton. So that was an art piece inside an art piece. Years ago, the National Science Foundation invited me to go to the South Pole. I was the PI of a, Antarctic, an NSF grant, an artist, uh, Antarctic Artist and Writers Program, and I created a moving timesheet. This is a clock made by moving ice. The South Pole stands on three kilometers deep of ice that moves 10 meters a year down the 60 meridian towards Argentina. So I decided to put a flag 10 meters apart marking where the South Pole stood at any point in time. And on each flag I put an important event that happened on the world above. At the point where I stood at the South Pole in 2007, 50 years since humans first landed on the pole, I planted a mangrove propagule, or a replica of one, otherwise I'd be killing a mangrove and polluting at the same time. So I took this ice replica and I put it there. It's gonna take 150,000 years, unless something like global climate change happens first for this mangrove propagule to theoretically set its roots on the water's edge. And it was my idea of juxtaposing human time frames with geological time frames as a science art piece. While in Antarctica, I also interacted with scientists who told me a little bit about the problem at hand. They gave me samples from these, the McMurdo Dry Valleys. I'm still part of that collaboration. Um, and I took those samples, of climate scientists studying the effects of climate change on this very specific location in Antarctica, along with glaciers that were given to me by scientists and put them on an ice painting. I melted the very ice that threatens to melt and drown our city, and then used these art pieces, these Antarctic ice paintings, in order to communicate the problem of sea level rise in Miami. In a sense, these drawings use the same process that threatens to drown our city, the precursor of horrors to come. I then used those same ice paintings to create the Underwater Homeowners Association, putting the elevation of people's properties in front of signs that would sit in front of their homes so we could map the topography of Miami and understand how sea level rise can impact us in the future. The process generated a homeowners group where they elected a chair. The chair happens to be, the chair of our group happens to be the chair of uh, the Ocean Sciences Department right here at Rasmus Bryan House, and working in his lab, we created a hurricane painting. The work that he does here at Rasmus is paramount to help us understand how it is that we're going to uh, model hurricanes, how we, how the, the spray, the heat that's transferred, the drag that happens at the interface of land and air, something that is very confusing uh, because there's spray in the air and there's bubbles in the water and you can't really figure out where the horizon is. So environmentally, it's hard to capture that data. So there's a huge laboratory here, the Sustain Lab, where they conduct extensive research to focus on the science. And what I did is I had the hurricane simulator unpaint a painting of a hurricane flag. And you'll get to see that later on in time as um, Brian and I and the rest of the team here continue creating art to move humanity forward. Thank you so much. Hi, good evening. I'm Rani Avisar, the dean of the school. I'm not going to introduce myself. However, um, it is a great pleasure to uh, introduce somebody that is very dear to us uh, as a school, a great uh, contributor to the university through his participation as a member of the board of trustees and a great entrepreneur and a great, great, great friend, uh, Steve Sainz. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, on behalf of the board of the university, I'd like to add my welcome to you all here tonight. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces. People have come to a number of these. I've been to many over the years myself, and I just love this program. So about, I don't know, nine years ago, in the Met, uh, I'm a real estate developer. In the midst of the worst real estate depression I've, I or anyone else around has ever experienced, um, I remember saying, but I just can't do another lousy real estate deal this year. And I went to Donna Shalala and I said, you know what? I love the ocean. I love the water. I love the ecology. 
what can I do to learn more about this? And she sent me over to, to meet Ronnie and, uh, and have a meeting with Ronnie. So I go to, I go to the dean of the school, and um, I'm not going to say that Ronnie's a good salesperson, but I walked out of that meeting as a full-time student in a master's program <laughs> and agreeing to take helicopter lessons from him. Um, and for the next two years, I went on to become a full-time student here at Rasmus, uh, you know, at, at a slightly older age than all of my classmates. It was a fantastic experience, and I urge you, if you ever have the chance to go back and get education, when you're not doing it for money, you're not doing it for a job, you're just doing it out of love and passion uh, for something you care about, it was a unique and wonderful experience. And one of the best parts of that experience was to get to know um, the scientists that make up this amazing place. I mean, this, this uh, campus over here is really one of the great jewels of the university. And the scientists here are just the best in the world at what they do. And it's really, it's very uh, invigorating, exciting to be around people who are great at what they're doing, who know more than anybody else does. And when you come here, you get a chance to, to see the type of work that gets produced by, by folks like these. And so, um, I just, I fell in love with the whole place. I fell in love with it. I've become uh, a donor to the extent, every extent I can to try to help this place financially and, uh, and spend as much time here as I can. And so I, I um, really appreciate those folks who have sponsored events like this and who continue to be uh, part of, of supporting this. And I would say to each of you, the fact that you're here, you probably love this place and love the things that it, it's, it's teaching the world as well. And I urge you to get involved and, and to help support this. If you want to get a chance to, to get a tour of this place and to, and to really find something that um, maybe you'd like to be supportive of, I'm sure we could arrange that for you. But this is a place you should support not just with your heart and your brain, but with your pocketbook as well. Because science is expensive, the government's cutting back, and, uh, and really this is a unique, unique gem in Miami. It's a unique gem in the world, and we need folks like you who care about it to, to come support it. So I hope you'll do that. And I really look forward to hearing what this guy has to say tonight. He's a unique human being. So thank you all. So I, I have the uh, enviable position of introducing Ronnie tonight. Um, uh, this is a unique opportunity for me. So it's not very often that you get the opportunity to embarrass your <laughs> dean. For those of you that haven't uh, noticed, uh, Ronnie's from France. Uh, maybe some of you have noticed. <laughs> I first met Ronnie when I was a postdoc. He doesn't remember this, although I, I reminded him of it the other day when he and I were at a, at a, at a dinner. I first met him when I was a, when I was a postdoc, and I just just gotten my first grant funded. So, you know, I thought I was just the bee's knees. I thought I was really special. And uh, we had this uh, principal investigator meeting. And my colleague that got the funded proposal with me, he, he, he whispered to me, that's Ronnie Avasar. And I said, is that Ronnie Avasar? He said, yeah, we, we got to impress him because he's the guy that's going to decide if we get funded the next round. So that was my introduction to Ronnie. I don't know if he remembers that. I don't know if he was impressed either. We didn't get funded on the next round. <laughs> Ronnie has a, a bachelor's, master's, and PhD, all from uh, Hebrew uh, University in Jerusalem. For those of you that don't know, he, he immigrated to uh, Israel when he was 17 years old, and so m most of his higher education was uh, in Israel. He did a postdoc at Colorado State, and then he became a, a professor at Rutgers, where he established the Center for Environmental Prediction. And so the reason I mention that is that's just one one little moment about one, of, uh, one key aspect of Ronnie's contribution to the field. I want to really, in this introduction, emphasize the breadth of Ronnie's contributions. So it's not just the tremendous science that he's done, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but it's the institution building. It's the infrastructure that pushes the science forward. And this Center for Environmental Prediction is just one, one example, and I'm, I'm certain to, to mention some others. While he was at Rutgers, he also became a distinguished professor. So, you know, all professors think they're distinguished, but this is actually a distinction that the university honors on its most distinguished professors. So he was a distinguished professor at a very young age at Rutgers, I might note. Uh, he was then quickly, after becoming a distinguished professor, recruited by Duke University to uh, chair their Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. 
And uh, he did some amazing things while he was at Duke. I think it's a tenfold increase in the external funding that, that uh, came into that department during his uh, tenure as the chair of that department. He uh, secured the funding for his first helicopter observation platform while he was at Duke, a very, a very impressive infrastructure building feat. And uh, he grew that department to be ranked in the top 20 in the United States um, uh, as departments of civil and environmental engineering, another tremendous feat. And so we were happy that he came to the University of Miami to make us a much better place. Um, so he was recruited in 2009. And so I wanna underscore the breadth at this moment, I'll be done soon, I promise. Uh, I want to underscore the breadth of Ronnie's contributions to the field. So I already mentioned a little bit about this, this notion of building, building better facilities, building institutions, building infrastructure to help enable science. But I also want to talk about the science he has done and some of the accolades he's received. So Ronnie is, of course, a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. He's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. He's the AGU, the American Geophysical uh, Robert E. Horton Award recipient. And then there's many, many more more accolades. One of the things, though, that I want to point out is, I, so I did a little bit of research on, on Ronnie uh, uh, today, and uh, one of the things that scientists do is we, we count our beans. We count our citation rate. How often are we cited? That's one of the most important metrics we have. And most papers published this day, most, the average paper that's published gets cited somewhere between two and ten times. Not very much. Somewhere between two and ten times. If a paper makes it over a hundred, we're dancing a jig in the office. Right? So most of us only have one or two or a couple of papers that over 100 citations. I stopped counting at 30. I stopped counting at 30 the number of papers that Ronnie has published that have over 100 citations. And a few of them were at 1,000. My feelings of inadequacy were overwhelming. I just had to stop. <laughs> uh, to underscore this notion of breadth, to underscore this notion of breadth, when you think about the kinds of work that Ronnie has done scientifically, he's, he's led observational uh, programs. He's designed observational programs. He's been in the field in the, in the Amazon uh, designing observing systems, implementing those observing systems, leading field campaigns, while at the same time, at the same time, Ronnie developed uh, over his career one of the most innovative uh, 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 forward-thinking modeling strategies for how to simulate and predict climate. And the idea here that's really, it's really foundational science, and it, it sometimes people forget how important this work is. It, the idea is how do you bring these large scale, continental scale climate drivers down to the regional, uh, the regional level? How do we figure out how to make those climate drivers help us make decisions about Everglades <coughs> restoration or sea level rise along the coast of Florida? How do we make that, how do we do the science to make those decisions? And Ronnie developed a technology, a modeling technology, to be able to do that. And this is called this uh, OLAM model, Ocean Land Atmosphere Model, is that the M is for? So it's a very famous model and it's, it's, it's really groundbreaking technology and sometimes, you know, he's so busy building uh, institutions and designing observing programs, we forget about these critical uh, contributions. Of course, as I mentioned, Ronnie came in 2009, almost done, I promise. Ronnie came in 2009 and, you know, when he walked in the door, uh, there were some, some serious challenges here. There were some serious issues that had, had to be done and uh, 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 problems that had to be taken on. And I just, I just want to tell you that, that Ronnie's done a spectacular job of mastering those challenges, of reformatting how we do business here, redeveloping how we do business here so that it enables science. And so I'm deeply, personally deeply in debt. The systems that Ronnie has put in place here has enabled me to do much more than I possibly could have imagined. And so I'm very grateful and I'm proud to introduce my colleague, my friend, Ronnie Avisar. Wow. Anything that I'm going to say now is just going to undermine what Ben has explained. So I thank you so much, Ben. It's really, it means a lot uh, uh, coming from you. And by the way, you have much more uh, references and citations than I do. So uh, Ben is an, an exemplary uh, scientist around. 
Um, I'm going to uh, uh, try to speak about hurricanes and hurricane prediction. I picked up that topic out of a few of them uh, because I think that one of the reasons that I came to Miami and that I was excited to come to Miami is because of the challenges that we have plus the location. Uh, you know, speaking about hurricanes and climate change, okay, has a lot of uh, consequences and a lot of uh, the, the academic uh, importance when you are in Colorado, when you are at Duke, but in Miami it has a real significance, okay? Whatever we are talking about here in Miami has an impact, okay, on our daily life. Understanding the weather and the climate is absolutely crucial and we are ground zero for that. So coming to Miami was a, a, a really, really a very interesting opportunity and uh, never regretted uh, to be here. On top of it, I got the opportunity to meet fantastic and work with fantastic colleagues, uh, Ben and Michael and uh, everybody that is around is just uh, an amazing place to work. Um, all right, so uh, another disclaimer, okay? It's the last talk of the season, and uh, it's a very hard um, uh, deal to, to close, but uh, I want to make sure that you understand that this is also a fundraising uh, uh, evening, okay? And so I appreciate that uh, Steve has introduced that. My goal is to try to present to you something that is super important for the future of Miami, I would say, Southeast Florida. I would argue that the team that we have here at the Rosensteel is set and is certainly the best team that we have worldwide to provide a way to predict hurricane that can be groundbreaking. I like to make the analogy between SpaceX uh, X, sorry, in English, and uh, uh, SpaceX and what is happening and the relation between SpaceX and NASA. And I think that what we are doing here, uh, we could be the Hurricane X, okay, of the NOAA and the prediction the centers. And that's really what I'd like to advocate for. So let me talk a little bit about what we know uh, 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 about hurricanes and what is it that we could do to improve and uh, certainly move forward the knowledge that we have about hurricanes. So the first things, I'm going to start from the simple to the little bit more complicated without getting into too many uh, details of the science. The first thing that we know is that we can look at uh, hurricanes that have happened in the past for as long as we have good observations and certainly with the development of satellites that has allowed us to look much more closely about location and tracks of hurricanes. So if you look at that, okay, you can notice that uh, most of the hurricanes are going to happen during this period of uh, mid-September. It's an interesting uh, aspect of uh, the, 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 the hurricane. Um, for those of you that are not uh, following that, you know, the moon and the sun oriented themselves in certain ways during the year and certainly over multiple uh, cycles of the year. This happens to correspond to a lunisolar oscillation that is a very characteristic, and that's an important component, and I think that we have not deepened enough into that type of, uh, of a variability and that type of event to assess better what's the relation really truly between hurricanes and that oscillation. A lot of the things that we do are you know, simplified because of the complexity of it. And uh, certainly this is one of the simplifications that uh, we have uh, forgotten over the time. But as I was putting my talk together and I looked into that, I thought, oh, you know, that's an interesting um, uh, component of the hurricanes and something that we have to look at a little bit more carefully. So the time of the year when it happens, okay, and this is kind of the distributions around September 10, which is the most, um, a frequent time of a hurricane. Second thing that we do really well with a satellite, by the way, I'm not going to mention every time that I speak and I'm not going to refer every time that I speak about uh, the different pictures that I have. They come from a variety of uh, scientists and the uh, websites. Uh, I just uh, collected them, okay, and tried to bring them together so that I can make a cohesive uh, uh, presentation. So this one comes from AccuWeather, which is a well-known company that is uh, producing uh, weather forecasting. But you can notice here the track of the hurricane, the most frequent 
track of the hurricane. So the most frequent time, September 10, the most frequent track, and you see that the heavy red, it's not coincidental, it happens next to the tropic. A lot of studies have been done, and we believe nowadays that in order to be able to get a hurricane developed, we need a minimum temperature of the ocean. It's not a secret. I'm, again, happy to speak about the formation of the hurricanes and how that uh, uh, evolved. But uh, uh, in order to uh, save time and speak about other things, I'm going to, uh, uh, to skip that. So remember, we need a temperature of about 80 degrees in the ocean. We need a deep uh, layer in the ocean of those 80 degrees because that's the source, eventually the source of energy that we are going to need to develop a strong hurricane. So the track, okay, is starting uh, west of Africa, typically, and it's developing and moving northbound after circulating in the, uh, in the Atlantic. So we have the date, we have the track, the next uh, thing that we would love to do, okay, is to have good statistics about the frequency of a hurricane in a given season. Colorado State University is one of the places that is uh, producing that uh, seasonal forecast, the way that it is uh, uh, known. And as you can see on the right side, by the way, this is the kind of the first, it just came out a couple of weeks ago, the first forecast for 2019. So I figure that a lot of you that are coming here today is to hear about what's going to happen this year. So based on the Colorado state, uh, it's going to be a below average a year. And uh, we can anticipate probably about five hurricanes, a total of uh, 16 days, all right? But if you look at the performance, it's not particularly brilliant, okay? And uh, we like to talk about that, and we like to make, a, you know, you'll hear the news, uh, start talking about it in about a month. Everybody will speak about the forecasting of the year, right? But the reality is that over the past uh, 14 or 15 years, the performance is not great. So you can see that here, uh, Colorado State predicted twice as many hurricanes that really happen, and so on. Here, twice less than, than happen, again here, here, Great year, they predicted exactly what would happen. And again, here in 2014, a great forecast. But overall, when you look at that, it's a two good shot out of a 14. So the performance is really not such an exemplary um, uh, performance. And on a seasonal basis, we use a lot of statistics. We are starting to lose some of the dynamics also. And in fact, if those of you that were here at the beginning of the year, remember the talk that uh, my colleagues Ben gave on that. And uh, the, 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 you know, the, the efforts that are doing and the achievements that have been uh, in that direction as well. So we are doing better, okay? but we are still far away from being able to predict what is going to happen during the season. And then the real question is, what do we care, right? I mean, what does it matter, frankly, if we have 10 hurricanes or 20 hurricanes and all of them are in the Atlantic, okay? So really at the end of the day, and the point that I wanna make here, okay, that is very, very important because it is something that has been to some extent underrepresented in the discussions that we have about forecasting a hurricane is how much of the surge will reach my house and how much of the wind am I going to get at my house, okay, to know if my roof and my windows are going to resist that wind. That's at the end of the day what we are interested in, certainly individually, but I would argue collectively as well. And the number of, those, uh, of uh, uh, the number of the hurricanes that are blowing in the Atlantic, while it's a very interesting academic and climatologic um, um, uh, forecast, from a practical point of view, it doesn't have a lot of importance. On the other hand, okay, and the uh, same thing, right? We can talk about having five hurricanes this year or even 10 hurricanes this year. But at the end of the day, if we live in Miami and the hurricane is going to Naples, 
obviously we feel bad for the people that live in Naples, but again, okay, from where we stand, we do not have to evacuate, we do not have to consolidate our houses, so the importance for us is much less significant. So this concept of forecasting a hurricane, understanding a hurricane, from a seasonal perspective, as well as a precise forecasting of where it is going to track and what is going to be its intensity, okay, is a, are really two different things. So, to leave the statistics, okay, which, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, uh, are not uh, fantastic, we as a scientist are trying to do what we call <laughs> predictive models, forecasting models. Those models, unlike the statistical models that are based on the history of what has happened and the data that we have collected on those, um, on those uh, hurricanes, the uh, predictive models are based on physical principles or physics principles. And if you write them in English, okay, in a simple English, philosophically they are very simple, right? What we are saying is that we are conserving momentum, okay? We are conserving mass. That means we are not creating and we are not dissipating any mass. We are conserving energy, meaning that we are not creating energy, we are not dissipating energy, we can account for it. We do the same thing with any scalar. The, the scalar that is the particularly important in our case is water. We are not creating, we are not losing it. It's there in the system. <coughs> and we can account for it. And last but not least, we have also an equation of state, which is a sophisticated word to say the, the, the ideal gas law that we have learned uh, in uh, high school. So that's what we know. Those are the principles that we know, and those are the principles that are behind any of the sophisticated models that uh, we are all talking about, okay? The prediction model, whether it is for weather or climate, same thing. Those are the five very simple principles. The complications comes when we try to use those principles from a physics point of view. Why? Because if we want to make those principles quantitative, if we want to be able to quantify what it means, then it gets a little bit more complicated. And here is the result of it, right? <laughs> So now we are dealing with a system of equation that becomes quite more complicated. It's, uh, you know, pretty much in Greek, okay, the same thing that is written in, uh, in uh, English, but just presented in a way that a scientist and physicist in particular can understand much better and can manipulate. I have written in very small here in green so that people in the back cannot read it, okay? Uh, but uh, fr frankly, what it says here is that this set of equation, if we know how to start it, in other words, if we know the condition, uh, the state of the, let's take the weather storm at a certain point, and we understand what is forcing from the outside that storm, in theory, we should be able to predict the weather perfectly, right? So that's really what it says. The problem with that is that for the mathematicians of you here, you can notice right away that this set of, um, this set of equation, which is what we call the simultaneous set of equations of differential equations that are nonlinear, do not have a solution. So we can write the equations, we know that they work together and that they have to work together, but mathematically we have not solved that set of equations. It remains one of the most important challenges of the geophysics, and I believe that there is a price of $10 million for whoever is going to solve that set of equations. So if you have young children, or if you are bored during your retirement, try to tackle that problem, and there is a great outcome of it, okay? A few people have tried. Um, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. So we have two options. We can take that set of equations, make it a little bit simpler, so that we can resolve it. And honestly, that's what meteorologists have done 
for about 50 or 60 years from the beginning of the 20th centuries until computers became much more common, the mid-60s uh, or the, mid seven, uh, the, the, uh, the middle of the 70s. Still occasionally, some people take that set of equations and try to use it in a way to understand again uh, some of the climate uh, effect. But the other alternative to trying to solve this set of equations is to modify them in a way that a computer can understand. In other words, we can modify that set of equations so that we can program it as a software into a computer in a way that we call discretization of those equations and put them into a computer model. And the result of that is this one, right? It's even more complicated, <laughs> but it's more complicated, but this one we can put into a computer and by trial and error, okay, we can start from a certain state, run it and run it and run it and run it and progress with time. And with that, being able to do a forecast of what is going to happen. Obviously, because of the complexity of the system of equation, it takes very often a supercomputer to simulate or it used, in fact, uh, to take a supercomputer to simulate a few hours. And, uh, you know, those few hours, it took more time on the computer to solve them than the real weather event, right? So you have to play with those things and uh, play with the resolution at which you are going to use. I'm going to skip the very details of uh, what is happening here, but I'm going to come back to it in a couple of seconds. What I'm saying, in fact, is that running a numerical model is not very different than running on a track, okay? In order to win a race and in order to do a good forecast, you have to do what we call an initialization. You have to be ready for that competition. You need to know how the ground is going to be. You need to know what the wind is. You need to know your adversaries. You need to know everything, okay, uh, at the beginning of the race. Then you have the start. And you know, some people have good starts, some other people have not good starts, some people have good shoes, less good shoes. You know, it's kind of a, a tough uh, game to play. And then you have to, uh, during that competition, you have to you know, be very precise and very organized at every step of the competition, of the run. And it is really the same thing that we have in our numerical models. We need to know the beginning conditions. We need step by step to know exactly what the model is going to be doing. If eventually we want to cross the finish line and win. And so a different way of uh, representing that is through that schematic, which uh, pretty much is telling you, okay, that in order to get a forecast, we have initial conditions. The problem is that those initial conditions, we don't really know them. Just imagine, we need to know what's happening in the atmosphere around the globe at a certain time. So let's say that I have noticed through satellite that there is a hurricane that is developing, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle of the, the Atlantic. To run my model, I have to take the entire planet Okay, and for each location of that planet, using pretty much a resolution of one mile, if I want to be able to do a good job, know exactly what the state of the atmosphere is, not only at one mile horizontal resolution, but everything in the vertical. And I need to know about the ocean, and to some extent, I need to know also about the continents. So it's a huge task, those initial conditions and how to play with them to run our model is a huge, very important task and a very important aspect of running a model. Okay? So that's what we do. Then the model, so the, and there are uncertainties, obviously. We are making a lot of approximations on this data. We collect data from satellites, we collect data from buoys, we collect data from airplanes, but it's just a small sample of the reality, and there is a lot of uncertainty in them. So the uncertainty of the beginning is going to affect the entire way that the system evolves because again, for the mathematicians of you, you have recognized that the system of equation in addition to be complicated, is also chaotic. That means that whatever you are going to start is going to end up at a place that we are not completely sure what it's going to be. 
So a lot of uncertainties in the model, a lot of the things that we do, we still make multiple approximations. We are, as I explained, the set of equations that we are really solving into the computers is not the original set of equations that are representing those five conservation principles. So we make approximations there. The way that we resolve okay, the equation, the way that computer works, make a lot of approximations. And that creates an uncertainty in the model itself and in the model run. So that at the end, the forecast uncertainty that we get is in fact you know, not fantastic. And that's where you see that spaghetti uh, prediction of the different models. Having said all that, we have made great progress over the years. And this is really a report from the 90s until 2070 uh, of the accuracy of the track of the hurricane. When we look at it one way before it arrives at uh, some point, two days, three days, four days, up to five days. And you can see that in the 90s, even one day ahead of time, the best that we can do on the average was about 100 miles. And those are, by the way, nautical miles, so take an extra 15% okay, tax on that. So really, it's a kind of 115 miles. For two days, the best that we could get is 200 nautical miles or about 230 uh, statute miles. And for three days, it was more than 300 nautical miles. We did not even go at that time into four days or five days forecast because the computing model, the, the computers that we had at the time were not able to produce this type of simulation in a reasonable amount of time. From the 2000, you have seen that, uh, for instance, what used to be predictable in two days now is predictable for three days and so on. So that in 2016 and 17, you can see that the prediction is still about 24 hours uh, um, ahead of time, plus minus 50 miles, right? And that's what, if you remember Irma, really a lot of the predictions were about Miami. Eventually, it ended up in Naples right, about 80 miles away. So that's kind of a, the imprecision that we have. And so on for two days, three days, four days, and five days. So a great progress over the years, but still a long way to go. Another way to look at the same data is looking at, uh, you know, the forecast period versus the track error, again, in nautical miles per decade. And you can see that here during the 70s, right, 60s and 70s, uh, we were doing, according to today, pretty poorly. This is the latest uh, sequence for 2010 to 2017, where now, you know, we get a 36 hours um, a prediction within about 15 nautical miles and so on. So great progress and great achievements. Mostly, I would argue, for two reasons. One of them is that we have much better initialization data to look at. So the data that we collect from satellite buoys, multiple sources are being analyzed and processed in a much better way than we used to be able to do. The second way is that the supercomputers that we are using today allow us to run the model at a much higher resolution. In other words, if you are looking at uh, Florida, and you are looking at the at at spot that the model represents. It used to be something on the order of 50 or 100 kilometers. And now the same spot, we can look at it with a camera, or if you prefer, that has the capability to do it at a two, three, four, or five kilometers. So much more precision in terms of the resolution of the tools that we have. What has not evolved the same way is the intensity of the hurricane. And if you notice here from the 90s to 2010, uh, not a lot of progress on the percent of error in terms of the wind that we have calculated or that we are calculating for the storms. So really, uh, on a one day, two days, three days, you can see that the error over the years has not progressed. Another way to look at it, similar to the previous set of slides, same thing. You can see that over that time period, 
in terms of the prediction, not a lot of progress has been made on the intensity. It seems to be a little bit better now uh, over the past decade, but still a long way to go. The next slide is kind of an old one, okay? It's back from uh, 2010, looking at the performance of the models as compared to a base, okay, which is really simply a statistical analysis. So you look at the, you know, the first slides that I have showed you and say, well, the chance that this hurricane is going to go this way, right, based on the statistics. And if you compare all the other models, and this is a set of uh, different uh, models that are used in the US and internationally. So obviously you can recognize, and I know that this is going to come, this is the ECMWF. Okay, that's the famous model that everybody believes is currently the most accurate. And you can see that its skill relative to the basic statistical analysis is in fact the highest. The dashed line that you see here is a kind of a manual consensus of taking several models and a man uh, looking into it and saying, I anticipate based on the performance of the different models that this is what we are going to get. The best models that we are using in the US, this one, HWRF, which stands for a high resolution weather research forecast, is uh, clearly not as uh, performant as the ECMWF. Let's talk a little bit about a specific storm that we all remember to really get back into the importance of being capable of predicting those things, okay? And this is Irma. I like to use this one not only because it was extremely significant uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of a hurricane, it's the fifth uh, uh, most expensive hurricane that we have on record, but also because I had time to take a lot and collect a lot of data uh, into it and uh, try to understand. So it started August 30th until September 13th. It was a category five at some point with the highest wind of 185 miles per hour at its top. So very strong wind, lowest pressure. It uh, killed, based on the record that we have so far, 134 people, including 52 directly. And just in the US, okay, the count of uh, 82 just in the US, we don't exactly know the indirect uh, uh, number of fatalities outside of the US. The cost damage is about $65 billion, okay, which as I have mentioned, is the fifth one uh, in, on record in uh, the US. Note, a particular interesting note, is that that year of 2017, we had, in fact, three of the five top costiest hurricane in the US, okay, between Harvey, Maria, and uh, Irma. And this is a very unusual picture to see, okay, collected from uh, satellites. But you can see that in one shot of that, or at one time of those satellites, you can notice four hurricanes in the Atlantic at the same time. That does not happen every day and every year. And I don't think that on record, there is another picture like that that is not a composite of multiple pictures that shows that kind of activity. So you have the leftover of the Harvey that stays over the Texas area for a long time. Irma that is approaching, uh, that is in fact on top of uh, Cuba and approaching uh, the US. And uh, Jose that was in the Lee, and then eventually Katia that uh, hit uh, Mexico. And the next slide, which is showing you at a very uh, fast uh, pace, okay, you have the clock running here on September 10, is uh, showing you the evolution based on the radar observations of the rain of Irma. I, the reason that I am showing you these pictures is because I want you to pay attention to the very refined details that are happening in that hurricane. If I take a numerical model that is capable of representing Florida with one grid point, I am missing completely what is happening as part of that hurricane. The details of it requires us and forces us to look at a scale that is a very tiny scale. Some of us claim that until we can achieve 
a model resolution on the order of one kilometer for a very large part of the world, we are never going to be able to predict hurricane more accurately than we do, especially in terms of its intensity. So very important uh, structure and very important to represent that structure to capture the intensity and simulate it. This is another comparison graph, okay, showing the performance, and I apologize for the colors that do not come out very nicely in our project projector, but uh, that represents again the position uh, absolute error, in that this time it's in kilometers, so uh, you have to uh, divide the miles by uh, 1.6, okay, or multiply, take 160 kilometers, give you 100 miles, 180 kilometers gives you about um, uh, uh, 100 uh, nautical miles. But the, what is written here is the name of the different models that are being used. And you see that here again, it's ECMWF, okay, which is the most performant model, including for IRMA, with relatively small error in terms of its uh, prediction. Here, uh, this is uh, the HWRF, okay, the one that is used operationally by NOAA to predict the track of the hurricane. So you can see that the performance is not as good, and I'm going to skip all the others because uh, really um, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't perform as well. The purple one, OFCL, is the official track provided by NOAA based on all the information that they have. So they try to take a consensus. They are very influenced by what they produce with HWRF, or the WARF as we call it. And also they are looking into ECMWF, but not too much because it's not politically correct. <laughs> so they just um, you know, try to do with that. All right, so you know, I have covered some of the, the aspect of it. And I am asking the question, of why is it so complicated to forecast? So I am summarizing that. So the first thing is that, as I have mentioned, the storm is influenced, or the storms are influenced by what is happening locally at a very high resolution. We need to understand much better, in fact, in each one of the convective cell of the hurricane, we need to understand what is happening so that we can predict the intensity better. But we need also to account for what we call the regional scale and the global scale meteorological event because a hurricane is not happening in a vacuum. And especially when you have a series of hurricanes that are coming one after the other, the first hurricane is going to affect the path of the next one and so on. Or is going to be affected by weather events that are located there. One of them, a significant one, is you know, the, the influence of the position of the jet stream, okay? That is, according to some scientists, uh, a weakening as part of the global warming that is happening. So that's kind of an, another important component of it. So the weather or the meteorology of the entire planet is really important to do. And the question, uh, okay, so that's uh, you know, from the, f the first part. As I have emphasized, the mathematical solution is still likely, okay? We know how to put the equations together. We don't know how to solve them. So we have a big challenge there. And uh, the atmosphere is uh, very chaotic. In addition to that, there are still a lot of physical processes that we do not understand correctly. One of them that is apparently super important is what is happening at the interface of the ocean and the atmosphere and their very strong winds and waves, okay? So that air-sea exchange of energy is another very important parameter that we honestly do not understand very well. And that's uh, the, the, the fourth reason why it's so complicated. If we don't know what uh, the process is, it's very hard to simulate it. And last but not least, if we wanted to make real observations of hurricanes to understand what's happening at the interface between the water and the air, we would need to go inside the hurricane on a boat or on a buoy inside the hurricane to make our measurement. And that's a challenge that many of us that are very courageous and dedicated to science are not willing to do. 
Okay. So um, what's next, right? We have started to develop, and I am going to advocate now about what is happening at Rosensteel and why I think okay, that developing the, the uh, center here that focuses on, on those issues is particularly important. Okay? So we have developed over the years tools that are, I would uh, argue maybe a little bit arrogantly, uh, unequaled okay, by any other organization, not NOAA, and not uh, Colorado State University and not any other place, okay? One of them is the modeling technology that we have. Uh, this one, in my case, okay, I like to uh, advocate about this one, which is the Ocean Land Atmosphere Model, OLAM, and for those of you that are going to the synagogue on Saturday, you know what OLAM means, and so, uh, you know, it has a good acronym. Um, it's a very special model. It is a very special model because it has the capability at the same time to look at the weather of the entire planet while putting at a very high resolution, okay, extremely high resolution over the core of the hurricane, the numerical grid, okay? And we have the capability of moving it dynamically, moving it with the storm. So this capability of a telescoping from the global scale to the micro scale to be able to simulate more precisely a storm like a hurricane is an extremely important parameter. We started to develop that model about 20 years ago. It has some very fundamental changes that have been made in the way that we do numerical modeling. This is now kind of the, the, the tool that uh, NOAA is uh, trying to develop or has been developing over the past uh, few years. So we are kind of a decade ahead of NOAA and any other institutions in terms of developing this model. By the way, the few equations that I have showed you convert in about 250,000 line of codes okay, when you put that into a computer simulator. So it's definitely not a trivial exercise. I'm just going to illustrate to you the simulation of one hurricane, and I'm not even going to mention the name, to show you that the model can perform and can simulate, in fact, okay, hurricanes relatively well. It's not yet fantastically uh, accurate, but it is performing, in my opinion, way better than ECMWF does, okay? In terms of the forecast when we use similar initialization data. One of the main differences that we have between NOAA and ECMWF is the vision of the, you know, the vision of the government in funding research. ECMWF has a very long-term view on the way that they are funding their scientists, and they are making a dedicated effort for 20 or 12, 30 years, putting in place people that can build a career around that. While in the US, we work with grants that typically last three years. And when you have a grant that lasts three years, you have to think about already the next grant that you are going to do. It needs to be cutting edge of science. Very difficult to get the system funded. NOAA is working from year to year according to the budget. It's very hard for them to make a long-term planning of what you know, the next generation of model is going to be 10 years or 20 years down the road because they never know if next year they are going to fire the people that they have recruited okay, and trained to uh, be able to solve those issues, which is kind of a non-issue uh, uh, you know, in ECMWF. So I would argue that, in fact, one of the main differences in the performance comes from that lack of vision that we have in the US in terms of funding our science. We have other facilities here that are very unusual. One of them is our sea stars facilities that has the capability to look from space at any storms, hurricanes, with different type of tools that again are unequaled, okay, especially using modern radar technology. We have, in fact, just uh, received a new, uh, or one of our faculty, Hans Graber, has received a new uh, grant to, um, uh, to develop the, the design of the next generation of satellites that is going to be based on a radar technology. So it's a kind of a great uh, achievement and a great opportunity. 
And that's another image of what uh, you can get out of those satellites. So obviously you can use them to validate the track of your, um, of your hurricane. And uh, something that is uh, coming up now that is becoming very useful is not only the track, but the wind intensity also that we get inside the hurricane. So fantastic technology when we have a satellite that will have the, all the capabilities that we would like to develop that's going to be another fantastic tool that uh, we will have. Uh, Javier talk about SUSTAIN, okay, which is the acronym of this um, wind wave um, facility that we have, that uh, we have uh, inaugurated, I would say about four years ago, five years ago already. Um, a lot of us have had the gray hair, okay, on, on developing that uh, facility. That includes uh, Mike Schmali, our associate dean for infrastructure. We worked, uh, they, we worked uh, tirelessly on, uh, on supervising this project. So we have established a wind wave uh, um, uh, facility. The, the benefit of that facility is that now, without having to put ourselves in a hurricane to make the observations that we want, which is almost impossible, right? We have brought the hurricane inside a machine where we can observe, in fact, what is happening in a real, almost in a real hurricane. And I'm going to run that. It's a small animation movie. And you are going to see what it means to be in a Hurricane Force 5 and uh, literally at home, watching that from the comfort of your seat. But the things that uh, we were absolutely unable even to uh, anticipate in terms of the processes. So Javier was right in emphasizing that a lot of it has to do with the aerosols that is leaving the water as a result of the wind, okay? And the relation between the winds and the, the aerosol is a something quite uh, impressive. So you see the formation of the waves, okay? And the wind is picking up. And the right here, I would say the wind is on the order of about uh, 70, 80 miles an hour. And as we go in these simulations, you are going to see what happens. So you hear the wind, the turbine acting. That's probably about a hurricane force three. Hour. Here you are, 137 miles per hour. And so really with that kind of uh, laboratory, if you prefer, we can study in much more details what's happening at this interface between the water and the ocean. Another, uh, another uh, interesting um, uh, aspect that we want to study in more details is what you see in that picture. So just a simple drop of water that we drop in the water, right? And what you can notice as part of that drop is the formations of waves away from that drop. Those waves are called gravity waves, okay? And those gravity waves, intuitively, we can understand that the stronger the drop of water I'm going to drop into the, the water, the stronger the waves are going to be, and more likely, the further away they are going to propagate. Right, so that's the principle. Well, we have developed, again, the tools here to observe or try to observe those gravity waves. This is, again, a field of gravity waves that has been simulated with the model, OLAM, that, uh, as far as I know, no other model has been able to simulate uh, until now. So it's very complicated from a modeling point of view to receive that, but it shows you also how complex that system of wave is developing from the hurricane. The hope that we have is that we are going to be able to make sense out of those waves and characterize based on the intensity of the hurricane and its position that we can assess from the, the position that we can assess from remote sensing and satellite, we should be able to characterize the strength of the hurricane without having to fly inside it. So here you can see the distance, right? This is the core of the hurricane. 
And you can notice that even 250 mile, uh, kilometers away, about 150 miles away, we can have a very good pictures of what that field is. And for that, we have developed a super machine, which is based on a helicopter with a complicated nose that has the capability of measuring those very gravity waves. So again, that has not been done in the past. The first person to detect gravity waves is Dave Nolan and his team, who is uh, our uh, department chair of atmospheric science. And we have taken on his idea and uh, put that on the helicopter and we, have, uh, we are going to be flying those uh, hurricanes, not inside the hurricane, but 200 miles away. And 200 miles away, we should be able to detect those field of gravity waves with the hope that eventually we are going to be able to use that, okay, to assess the intensity of those hurricanes. And here I have a nice uh, video of the helicopter, and I always use the opportunity to show it. So it's again a very unique uh, capability that we have at the Rosenstein and the University of Miami. Uh, as you can recognize, it is equipped with a very uh, specific equi you know, equipment. You get the idea. So I'm going to, uh, uh, in order to uh, complete my uh, presentation, I want to just uh, emphasize the number of people that we have here working on the multiple component of the, the hurricane. And I apologize for those that I have forgotten because I'm sure that uh, we have additional people. But uh, as an institution, we have really multiple aspects of hurricane forecasting that is being done by a team of very dedicated faculty scientists and extremely competent uh, faculty scientists. So uh, just, uh, uh, you know, to impress you with uh, what we currently have, uh, there is something else that I want to mention here. We have a website, okay, that uh, has been developed by, um, uh, by uh, Brian McNoldy. Uh, that uh, uh, provide uh, uh, a lot of information on hurricanes and hurricanes forecasting. And so for the new season that is coming, I really encourage you to go to the website and uh, look at what is happening, especially when a hurricane is coming our way. It's probably one of the best way to get educated about uh, what's coming up. So we talk a little bit about, you know, the use, right, uh, that we have. And uh, we s didn't speak about the cone of prediction, but uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in our opinion, that cone of prediction that tells us two thirds of the time where the chance of the track of a hurricane is coming, while it is an interesting uh, uh, piece of information, in practice does not provide us the details that we can operationally use to make our own decision, right? in terms of evacuations, consolidation, closing business, and so on. So that's uh, really uh, some of the explanations about the hurricane and uh, showing that uh, over the years that the cone of predictions has uh, became a little bit smaller, so it becomes more and more precise. And you have uh, over the years here the accuracy for one day up to five days of precision. And if I just use that uh, lower la uh, line, you see that in 2008, that cone of prediction, okay, was on the order of uh, 305 uh, miles. And uh, nowadays, it's about a two thirds of that with a progress upcoming. But as we already emphasized, the cone of prediction is one aspect that is interesting, but is probably not the most valuable aspect of what we want to get from hurricanes. And another aspect that is super important to understand that uh, we are just starting to develop better is the surge impact of the hurricane. And as you can see here, with the mean sea level 
coming and uh, rising all the time, the impact of hurricane and of the surge is going to intensify and affect us more and more in coastal area. So I'm going to skip all that just to emphasize that the wind speed and the category is one aspect, okay? The common is another aspect, but the capability of predicting the surge also is something that is super important. What I am suggesting here is to establish at uh, a Rosensteel a hurricane prediction and broadcast broadcasting center. It is not based on nothing. I have emphasized here some of the world-class technologies that we have already developed that are existent. We have a team of people that can work on those problems. But what we do not have is the funding mechanism to have a long view of what we need to do and we know that we need to do in order to be able to produce a strong forecasting center, okay, a strong forecasting uh, capability. We need for that, you know, to have the capability to think for the next 10, 12 years of what we need to put together in order to be able to provide a forecasting tool and a broadcasting tool that will be valuable to the community. So what I'm saying here is that uh, we, need, uh, uh, we need dedicated manpower. You can see that I have put in bold the components that we need, right? It's all about manpower. Really, when you think about it, we have some fantastic resources already. We need to be able to take a team of young people dedicated to that uh, task and promise them funding for the next 10 to 15 years and put them and dedicate them to that task of completing this, uh, this uh, forecasting system. I really honestly believe that that's the major stop that we have. Funding, again, in the agencies, in the government, doesn't work this way. Funding at a research organization like us currently doesn't work this way. We cannot obtain grants, you know, for the next 12 or 15 years especially when the mission is uh, similar to what the government is doing. So we need to be able to engage the community, you, all right, to help us put that together. Um, I would recommend that, uh, you know, as part of this center, we operate our own prediction model. I believe that we have uh, tools, okay, to have one of the top models in the world anyway, uh, and emphasize, you know, to redevelop uh, some component of it. And then we need to be able to distribute and disseminate the information so that anybody that lives in a coastal area can have access and know exactly what is happening for them. So what do we need? We need a group of five to seven scientists funded for the next 10 to 12 years. It's not such a big deal when you think about it. We are talking of about $1.5 million a year for the next 10 years. So a total of 15 millions. And that ratio, uh, you know, uh, uh, that has been used by uh, NASA versus uh, SpaceX, okay, as you probably know, uh, SpaceX is putting to space satellite for the co at the cost of about $400 million, which is a lot of money, but a study has indicated that uh, NASA would take about $4 billion to do the same thing. So the ratio between what a private organization dedicated, you know, can do as compared to what the government can do is about one to 10. And this number that I am reaching here of about 15 million is in fact, okay, probably what the NOAA could do with $150 million. So uh, I am, uh, uh, you know, emphasizing this point uh, another, um, another point that is important to understand is that the idea is not to replace everything that we are doing and certainly not to replace the relation that we have with NOAA. We have an extremely productive relation with NOAA that is allowing us to do some fundamental research in the different aspects of, of weather and climate and we want to continue that relation. This is kind of a dedicated task that would enhance our activities uh, rather than duplicate or reproduce. And the last slide that I want to uh, present to you here 
is the kind of a strategy that uh, we have in terms of our uh, fundraising campaign at the school and emphasizing again the importance of a hurricane as compared to everything else that we are doing. So predicting hurricane is certainly an important component, but the school is extremely broad in terms of uh, what we do. And uh, you know, we have, uh, at the end of the day, what we are interested in is to create knowledge that we can communicate, disseminate to the communities, as well as educate our students. And we have developed, or we are developing four pillars of uh, fundraising. One that consists of uh, saving lives, and in that category, we have hurricanes, sea level, tsunamis, red tides, you name it, all those uh, activities that the school is working on and that uh, belongs to that uh, category. We have another category that consists of feeding the world, and that's the work that we do in aquaculture and fisheries, for example. We have also another thing, the ocean secrets. And we have a lot going on over there, you know, between weather, which is strongly connected, obviously, to the, the ocean, the climate, but also other disciplines that uh, maybe many of you are not particularly aware of, like, for instance, fundamental medicine that is being conducted at the school, where we study neurophysiological diseases based on uh, animals that uh, we have here and the studies that are being done. And then last but not least, uh, uh, protecting our resources. And that's all the work that we do on coral reef and uh, uh, marine wildlife and fish and um, to some extent our economy. And to support that structure, okay, what we need eventually is the support of our professors, the scholarships, the platform and the equipment. And with that, I am going to conclude my too long talk, but uh, I appreciate your patience. <laughs>